Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to another episode of Did You Know, where you literally know what you need to know. Alhamdulillah, today we're going to be discussing a very important topic. Now, this topic is important to me because it affects the growth of our society. And we're going to be talking about maternal death. What I mean by this is women dying across the globe, even in Nigeria, across the northern part of the country. Alhamdulillah, we have been blessed with uh, Dr. Selma Ibrahim Anas Kolo who was the former Commissioner of Health in Borno State and presently the Director of Family Health in the Ministry of Health. We'll be having this conversation, but before we deep dive into this conversation, stay tuned and we will be right back. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. How are you doing? Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So I was actually thinking, you know, well, should I call you uh, mommy or should I say doctor? Because of course you're my mother. But alhamdulillah for the fact that people are watching, I'm going to stick to the doctor. Is that okay? It's okay, whichever <laughs> you choose. <laughs> Mashallah, alhamdulillah. Welcome to the show. Thank and you. And before we start our conversation, I really want to, you know, thank you for the work you're doing out there, saving lives and likes of it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the most amazing jobs you've done in Borno State, which really went to me, was the fact that um, during the, you know, the, the, the crisis there and people dying likes of it, you were mm -hmm. able to create an avenue whereby... Uh, you know, you, you talked about the psychological state of those people, which mm. was really important. Mm. We ask that to bless you for that because in, uh, in Nigeria, people don't usually think about the mental health of people. Mm. So may Allah bless you. Well, back to our topic for today. Uh, we want to talk about maternal death. Mm. And for me, this is really deep because uh, my mother was affected by this. And in Islam, women have been honored beyond reasonable doubt. Mm -hmm. And, you know, women have been put on a very high pedestal. Mm -hmm. But to come to the realization, when my mom went through, you know, a complication during childbirth and everything, mm -hmm. I was really worried. Like, I felt, you know, my mom was going to go, but subhanAllah, Allah made it easy for her. Yeah. But I don't got to realize that, okay, it wasn't only my mom. And there are a lot of statistics. So mm. when I was going through the statistics, I got to realize that more than 800 women die in the northern part of the country every day. Mm. And this is even bigger than the corona <laughs> far, pandemic. Far, far, bigger. Far, far, bigger far, far, bigger. far, far bigger. That we have right now. Mm. And I got to realize, subhanAllah, you know, that 800 people that die every day, and I did a statistic on Instagram, and I asked people, you know, do you know people who have passed away from, uh, uh, you know, childbirth complication? Yes. 73% of people on IG, say mm. on Instagram, said yes, they, they know people. Asha so, and I realized that statistic, yes. you know, we saw this, I was thinking it's a number. Yeah. SubhanAllah is not just a number. Mm. That number is someone's mother. That number is someone's sister. Mm. That's, so that number is someone's daughter. Sure. So, when we say these are preventable, doctor, what does it mean that a death are preventable? and you know, it can easily be stopped mm. and uh, like so what does that mean yes so uh, even before i said that let us be clear on what we meant by maternal death mm. you know they are all death associated with pregnancy right. delivery and post delivery especially within the 42 days post deliveries yeah. so any death of a mother that happens as a result of these circumstances it's called maternal death mm. and as you have rightly mentioned it is big but yet, nothing is happening. Nothing is happening about it. The good news about it is that most of these deaths are preventable. More than 90% of the deaths could be prevented because they are not sophisticated interventions. Most of it is around having the information, the knowledge, and taking the right action in a timely manner. So what we say is it's a, it's, a, it's a joint responsibility, not only for the woman, mm. because the woman does not exist in vacuum. Okay. She exists within a family, and the family exists in a community. And there are support mechanisms within communities and also by government, including religious leaders. So it's a totality of responsibility of every and each one of us to help the woman to understand the situation she is in. In, to access services in a timely manner and to have her baby delivered safely. So uh, most of the causes, if you look at it, it has to do with our cultural beliefs. Mm. So let me just put it in this way before we even move further. Any pregnancy that happens too early, that is if the girl is very young, she's immature, is risky. It's called a risky pregnancy. Mm. 
Secondly, if that pregnancy happens also in a woman that is too old, it's a risky pregnancy. Mm. And what we said by too young, for me, I prefer even to say any pregnancy that occurs below the age of 18 on the average. And that that happens anything beyond the age of 27 is a risky pregnancy. And then when the pregnancies are too many, any pregnancy that is above four becomes a risky pregnancy. Because God designed our uterus like a balloon. It swells up, it's elastic, and it comes back. So you remember if you have a balloon, you blow it once, it comes back. You blow it two, it comes back. You blow it three times, it reaches a stage that it does not come back. It becomes relaxed mm. because of so much pressure. So scientists have shown that any pregnancy that is more than four, it becomes a pressure to the uterus. That is where the baby stays. Mm. And then the elasticity of the uterus begins to wear, wear off. And then when it wears off, the implication is that it does not come back. So it can either bust with the next pregnancy, or you can start bleeding. Because it's the bleeding that brings back, contracts the uterus. And then the, the, the blood vessels contract and the bleeding stops. So when it is too much pregnancies, it reaches a stage that it can. So that is another risky pregnancy, any pregnancy that is more than four. And then when the pregnancies are too frequent, you know the uterus get exhausted. The human, human body, the woman's body gets exhausted. So at least there should be two years intervals between pregnancies so that the uterus can, uh, can ref refresh itself. The mother's body, her energy, her immunity can be refreshed, can regain her strength before she prepares for the next pregnancy. So in summary, you see we have summarized it into four. Right. I know I, you will agree with I'm, me I'm that... I'm so surprised <laughs> right now. I'm so surprised right now. Because I never knew uh, what, what you're saying right now. And I don't, you know, it would never come to my thought mm. that there is a reason why, you know, uh, these things happen and why yes. it should be prevented. Yes. But, you know, doctor, these informations are not out there. They are not that, out there. That is true. Especially when, you know, when I was going through the statistic, it's more in the northern part of the country, mm. right? You know, mm. and people are not aware mm. of most of this information. Mm. You know, in your capacity, what do you think we can do, mm. you know, to begin to spread this information for people, for people to get to know mm. more about them? Yes. I, I think you are absolutely right. We need to do more in giving the information to people mm. to understand that these deaths, we can prevent them. We can drastically reduce with information. So you are right, information is not passing across. Despite the much efforts that we are doing as health workers to send the information. But I've come to realize that it's not only responsibility of health workers. Probably we are only talking to ourselves as health workers. Right. We only wait for the patients to come to the hospital or we go to the community talking by ourselves. So I think what we need to do differently, and I, alhamdulillah, I'm happy that you have started doing that, is talking to people like you, getting our, 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 our learned scholars to speak, especially to men, because men are the gatekeepers. Men give the permission to women and give them the instruction. So we need to get greater involvement of our religious leaders that will be talking about this in any fora, especially in the masjid, enlightening men about the importance around all these issues that are summed up in four. The need for a woman, as soon as, soon as she's pregnant, to attend and to register in a clinic close to her mm. which will, for antenatal care, so that the pregnancy will be monitored from the beginning, because that helps you to easily identify problems quickly and see how you can address the problem. The need for a woman also to deliver in facilities by, by skilled, uh, trained health workers, exactly. We call them birth attendants. Mm. These are the nurses, the midwife, it could be a medical doctor, it could be a community health extension worker, but trained to de receive deliveries. Mm. Not the traditional birth attendants that are not trained in our communities. I'm not saying they are bad, they are very good, but we will work with them so that they can detect and link women to the health facility as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. So this is very important. Immediately after delivery, the woman needs to be monitored also. 
especially within the 42 weeks post delivery, because anything can happen. So, you know, once we have that kind of information and we continue to disseminate the information, and we are using the information without resistance, inshallah, we'll be able to drastically reduce maternal death in our communities. And as you rightly said, this is even um, most common in the Muslim community. And when we engage with a lot of our religious leaders, there is no justification for that to happen. As you rightly say, Islam is a religion that protects the woman and also the children. So, uh, and then you find that why the resistance? Why the resistance? And this comes to talk about using even the family planning commodities. A woman can space her children, which we call child spacing or what some people call it, healthy timing and spacing of pregnancy. And you say, we say, uh, the spacing improves the health of women. So how can she space without using the family planning commodities? And these family planning commodities are readily available. So a woman can time even up to two years, three years, or four years, mm -hmm. so that she can uh, get back herself, her health, and also be able to effectively and adequately take care of the baby through exclusive breastfeeding, continuing to breastfeed up to two years, and we all know the benefits. Alhamdulillah, Islam has all said, uh, uh, taught us how to do that. So, so you see, but it's, it's information sometimes that are hard but not utilized. Sometimes there are information, as you said, a lot of people are ignorant. They are not aware of it. Mm. Mm. You know, Dr. Amazing, I, I don't want you to stop talking because this is really <laughs> interesting. But, um, you know, you spoke about, you know, having access to a healthcare facilities and like of it. Do you think that there are enough healthcare facilities, especially in the northern part of the country, for the fact that, the, you know, most, most of we from the north do not consider it as a problem mm. that is happening? Do you mm. think there are a lot of facilities that way? Well, I will not say there are enough because when I say facilities, it's not just the building. Mm. It's not just having a hospital, but it's having a hospital that is functioning or a clinic that is functioning. It could be as small as this, your room, mm. but the clinic has all the necessary equipments, basic minimum equipments, drugs for life saving. It has the human resources, the human beings that will work, medical personnel, not necessarily a medical doctor in all facilities, but at least a trained nurse or midwife, a community health extension worker, a laboratory scientist or a laboratory technologist. You know, so once you have those, a pharmacist or a, pharmac a pharmacy dispenser, once you have those mixed of health care workers in a facility, that makes the facility to be functional. And you know, when you look at the infrastructure again, the facility must have electricity. And you go to some of our facilities, not even electricity. Women are delivered using touchlight or lamp or candles. So we have to have electricity, not just to light the room, but also to maintain some of the equipments that you have. You must have the space, adequate space. You must have privacy. Because privacy, lack of privacy is another deterrent also to women. Uh, visiting facilities because they felt there's no privacy, no confidentiality. And as a Muslim woman, we want to be protected. We want to be comfortable in the space that we are and ensure that we are, we, are, we are protected. Not where you will have several women having babies and then all other men coming into the same delivery rooms. So you see, it's not conducive. So the environment has to be friendly to women, whereby when a woman is in labor, she can have her husband around with her in a safe space that is protected. So we are still lacking in most of these things. And then uh, when I talk still about some of the things that make it uh, you know, functional, it's, uh, it, it, it's quite a lot, it's quite a lot, it's quite a lot. So a woman has to have that environment and then the health facilities have to be protected. So if you look at the Nigerian system, the government designed it in such a way that we have different levels of care. We have the tertiary level, which are the teaching hospitals and the federal medical centers. We have the secondary levels, which are the general hospitals. And then we have the primary health care. So by design, the expectation is that most women, because it's, uh, uh, it's, it's expected that most pregnancies and deliveries should not be complicated. So most of these deliveries and antenatal care services and postnatal care should be able to be handled at the primary health care level once the primary health care are functional. 
And this is the efforts now to see that we have a functional primary health care with all this mix that I have mentioned from infrastructure, human resources, medical supplies, and even emergency ambulances that transport women from their home in case of emergencies to the facilities. That yeah. means that, you know, Doctor, <laughs> before we go on, on this conversation, we're going to take a short break and inshallah, we will write one. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> All right, dear viewers, welcome back. As you've known, we are discussing a very, very interesting topic that affects the fabric of our society. And alhamdulillah, Dr. Salma Anas <laughs> has been doing amazingly with the topic. We ask God to bless her. You know, Dr. Anas, welcome back. Thank you. Um, you know, we just spoke about a lot of things. And I didn't want you to keep to stop because I was really enjoying exactly <laughs> what you're saying. And I think we need to find a way to disseminate this information mm. in the best of ways, in different mm. languages, so that people will know, and our women and our sisters and our daughters will stop dying. Yeah. You know, do you have any experience that you've gone through, either passionately or when during your lifetime, mm. that has um, you know, maybe affected you in one way or the other, or maybe changed your perspective? Mm. Yeah, of course. You know, growing up in, uh, in northern Nigeria, in a community in Bornu, this is something we all grew up to see happening. A girl is married of maybe at a very early age, mm. before the age of 12 or 13. And then uh, before one year into the marriage, she gets pregnant. And then the next thing you hear that she has died as a result of pregnancy. So for me, I grew up to see this a lot happening in my community. And, at, and I was scared of even having a baby myself because it like, is that a normal thing in the society that should happen? Then I came to realize that it's, it's not the normal. And then uh, I, I have had my own personal experience and I have seen people dying. I think the closest that I have seen, I have seen my sister-in-law died as a result of childbirth, which is preventable. It is so sad it happened. Uh, may Allah grant them al Jannat Fiddaus. So, and I, as a woman, I have had my own personal experience. Maybe I would have been part of the statistics, but Allah knows that I still have a lot to contribute. So uh, I have had my, my, my babies through cesarean section, and then I, I have had one that was so complicated, so complicated, and then uh, it was, if not, alhamdulillah, coincidentally, I was in the US for a conference. I was thinking if it was in Nigeria, will it be able to be handled? Yes, because uh, the baby came prematurely, and then uh, as soon as I had the baby, I started bleeding bleeding i went into shock mm. i was resuscitated then i developed what one of the complications also that we call preeclampsia postpartum preeclampsia where women easily go into co coma and they just lose their life so this is was a personal experience that i have gone through but alhamdulillah what worked there is not anything that is sophisticated or beyond what we can do in nigeria or what we can do in any community in nigeria and this is where I talk about totality of a functional facility mm. and acting in a timely manner. Immediately, immediate intervention was done. I was resuscitated, blood was transfused, and I came back to normal life. So you see, what we have is the, is the time, like, because you're talking about life saving. If your woman starts bleeding during delivery or post delivery, it's like you open the tap. You can imagine you have a bucket of water and you just open the tap and it starts flowing. It drains completely and then she goes into coma, goes into shock, into coma. And for the time to intervene, it, we're not even talking about uh, seconds, minutes. You're talking about seconds. So our health facilities, they have to be able to function effectively. And then uh, not even at the health facility, and I will tell you, where the problems lies. And we summarize those problems in, as the three delays, mm. the three delays that contributes to maternal death, especially in Nigeria, worst even in northern Nigeria, where a lot of cultural beliefs and lack of information continue to perpetuate such acts. The first delay is at home. Who decides for the woman to go to the hospital? Mm. That is the first delay. Most of our sisters, most of our mothers, most of our daughters, 
cannot take decision to go to the hospital. They must ask permission of the husband. Without the permission of the husband, the belief in that they feel that is the right thing to do. And I want our ulamas to talk more about it. It's rather she die at home rather than to go to the hospital. So the woman, that delay happens. If the husband is not around, she can't go. Nobody can take the decision. And the worst experience I have had, going back to experience, I have met a woman that died after staying for 13 years trying to get pregnant. She got pregnant. She was brought to the hospital very late with eclampsia in coma. And then we asked the reason, I asked the reason, why didn't you bring her in time? Because this should have been averted. And the husband said, subsequently the woman died anyway. She lost her life. And the husband proudly, with all sense of responsibility, told us that he's proud of his wife for not coming to the hospital because he was not at home. Mm. So he's happy she died that way. So I think more sen sensitizations, and this is not my job. I'm not learned. I expected our teachers, our learned scholars, to elaborate on that and educate our men and brothers. At what point does the woman take decision on issues that are critical to her life, even at the point of death? This is a story, and this, this happened at the, the beginning of my career as a house officer. So you see, this is a delay. And then uh, the woman is not responsible. Then the second delay is how do you take the woman to the health facility? At what, how do you, are there emergency ambulances? that can easily convey her. So this comes to beyond even the health sector. A road is an issue. Some communities do not even have access roads. Some, the vehicle to transfer the woman is not there. Some, they have to use even donkey to transport the woman. So this is the another delay. And you know what makes it different from developed country? Immediately you call an ambulance. And alhamdulillah, those are part of what saved my life. And the ambulance come to your house within few minutes, at most five minutes. They don't just pick you, they begin to administer first aid. If you are in shock, they begin to resuscitate you. If you need oxygen, they begin to give you oxygen. So you're taking of an ambulance that have an emergency life-saving equipment, drugs and everything where they need. And they convey you to the hospital. So you see life is saved at the point of pickup. So this is, this is another thing that we are still struggling. And this is beyond even the family. It's community, it's the government itself, efforts that can help to achieve that. Alhamdulillah, there is a community that was able to do that in Jigawa. It went viral, yes. Women came together, saved money, bought an ambulance, got a driver with the community, with their own money, village women. Yes, it's a very interesting story, and I think we should share that story so that all communities can also sit up and take responsibility for the lives of their families. So this is the second delay, the transportation. Going to another delay is a delay that happens at the facility. The woman reaches the hospital or the clinic. What happens? And this is problem of the health facility. Action is not taken immediately. You come as an emergency. Nobody attends to you as an emergency. You are asked to go to the record, go and register. You come, you sit down, waiting to see the medical personnel. And then a lot of death happens also within the hospital. Due to delay in taking action. It could also be delayed due to lack of equipment within the hospital. It could be delayed due to lack of the right human resources to save the lives of the mother. So you see, it's a facility that is not functioning, and that is the cause of the delay. So these three delays, if you look at it across the spectrum, from the home to the health facility, it's everybody's responsibility. Right from the home, the community, the, 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 the government itself, the, the community leaders, the religious leaders, the health personnel, the managers of health, the policy makers, it's a total 
responsibility of all. Amazing, you know, uh, this is really amazing. We ask a lot to make it um, easy. Um, you know, you know when you're talking about transport, I've seen cases whereby a woman is being transported with a wheelbarrow. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, say so you said something amazing during the way you were having your complication. They began to administer the, you know, you begin to attend to you even before they take you to the hospital. Yes. So here, before they even take you to the hospital, <laughs> you, you might have gone. You exactly. Might be exactly. We ask a lot to make it easy. You know, Doctor, um, I want us to continue this conversation. But a lot. Uh, we don't have time, but we're gonna have more of this conversation. I think this is really important uh, for the public to know, for the Muslim Ummah mm -hmm. to be more aware mm -hmm. of what is really happening and how we can stop this. I hope to see maybe, uh, inshallah, any community leader that yeah. is watching this right now, you can look into your community, mm. you can find ways to see how can you propose solutions. You know, you don't need to get a very huge, uh, you know, facility for you to be able to administer help and likes of it. We can help in our own way. I remember, Absolutely. Allah is going to ask you on what you did, what was your responsibility towards this? Because these are our mothers. And you remember the Prophet Allah said, we should honor our mothers, mm. right? Mm. Three times. You know, this is part of honoring the women in our community, our mothers. If this was your mother in this situation, how would you feel? So dear viewers, you know, we need to find a way to find a solution to this. And inshallah, here at Did You Know, we will do as much as we can to uh, spread as much awareness and we ask a lot to make it easy. Uh, doctor, this is really beautiful having. Now I can call you mommy. Mommy, thank you so much for <laughs> yeah, coming welcome. on thank the you. show. And uh, you know, you're the first woman I'm having ever on my show. <laughs> MashaAllah, so Alhamdulillah. What a privilege. Thank uh, you so much. We ask a to bless you. JazakAllah khairan. Amin Ya Rab. Thank you so much. So there we was, Inshallah. alhamdulillah, we've come to the end of this episode. You've known what you really need to know. What we need to do right now is to internalize what we've had from the doctor and try to see how we can proffer solutions. Make a change in your society. You're the change that you want to see. And we ask Allah to make it easier upon us. Yeah. Until we meet again, we'll leave you all in the care of Allah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. information